We're talking with Reed Lindsay, and you are the director of a great documentary called The War on Cuba. And this is produced by the uh, Belly of the Beast. And can you tell us a little bit about that project, Belly of the Beast? Sure. Belly of the Beast is a, it's a media organization, um, a journalistic organization. We also do documentary film. And our focus is Cuba and U.S.-Cuba relations. Uh, it's composed, it's based in the U.S. and our, and our primary audience is in the U.S., but, uh, but it's, uh, it, we have uh, US-based journalists like myself working alongside uh, Cuban journalists as well. And we try to uh, do the opposite of parachute journalism. So instead of Western journalists like myself coming in, reporting and leaving or reporting from a, from a US or from a, let's say a nor global Northern perspective, um, we, are, uh, we have a, 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 a lot of amazing journalists uh, and filmmakers from Cuba who are, are uh, active in, in determining um, what stories we cover and how we cover them. I see that the, the uh, producers here are um, Oliver Stone and Danny Glover, and uh, I also see that Medea Benjamin's in on this. So um, was it their idea to start this, or how did this whole thing come about? No, it, it wasn't their idea. It, it was, def it was a, a, a group of us, uh, um, journalists and, and filmmakers uh, from you know both in the U.S. and Cuba that are uh, that were this sort of originated, uh, but uh, Danny Glover and uh, and uh, has a, all three of those individuals you mentioned have a long history of of, of very positive work in Cuba, working in, in solidarity, um, and so um, so we reach out to them because um, we feel like. Uh, the work that we're doing through Bell the Beast, the, the, the video work we do and uh, the journalistic work we do can have a, a big impact. It can be a really powerful tool to educating people, informing people about uh, the truth about Cuba and U.S. relations towards Cuba, and hopefully inspiring people as well to take action. Um, so we reached out to them to see if they'd be willing to support the project, and, and we're very grateful that, that, they, that they did. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people in the United States are really uh, in uh, support of uh, eliminating the blockade uh, with Cuba, right? And uh, uh, I've actually thought about going to Cuba myself because I'm kind of tight with the Seattle Cuba Friendship Committee going back 30 years. And uh, so I thought about uh, going to Cuba, you know, with the uh, Pastors for Peace caravan. Right, which is uh, every year they would have this caravan to bring, uh, you know, aid to Cuba and uh, they would break the blockade, right? And then I think, I don't think that anybody ever got uh, arrested or anything because I don't think that they want to actually make a big stink about it because I would just give more publicity, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> negative publicity to the United States uh, illegal blockade, I think. But um at any rate, uh, I can never do anything as cool as what you're doing. You know, I just think that this is pretty amazing. And, uh, but uh, the journalists that you uh, have in Cuba, you know, how did you hook up with them? Well, uh, well there's, you know, Liz is the presenter, uh, but there are other journalists who played a big role in, in making the series that you don't see because they're behind the scenes, as well as other filmmakers. Uh, the director of photography is Cuban, the designer is Cuban, the editor is Cuban. And, you know, just uh, the asking around and meeting and talking to people and people know people. And um, there are a lot of incredibly talented people here. And the, this is an issue, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the embargo and more recently uh, the intensification of sanctions against Cuba uh, carried out by the Trump administration uh, is an issue which is enormous, of enormous uh, uh, impact in Cuba. And it also impacts in the United States because uh, Trump won the election in Florida. It very well could have been the difference in the, in the, in the general election and it could be in the future. And a lot of his, uh, his success in Florida has been attributed to his success, to his Cuba policy. So US policy towards Cuba has a big impact on, Cuban, on the Cuban people. And it also has an impact on US politics. And it's remarkably uh, an issue that receives very little coverage. Um, uh, by the media. The US media, a uh, mainstream media, doesn't really cover it. Um, there are independent uh, 
journal and media in Cuba. They're not really interested in that subject. Uh, the Cuban state media uh, covers the issue, but I, they, they don't do it in the way that we did it. They don't do it in a way, uh, it's, it's often a lot of um, sort of, uh, sort of they cover it in a very political way that's often not a, as, as human and as detailed and specific as we've done so. And so we've, we decided to combine, you know, what we do with Belly the Beast is try, we try to do very high quality video that can engage a young audience um, and that an older audience also can appreciate, but that can definitely reach a young audience. And, and, um, and, and but taking on important subjects like this that are, that are ignored. So, um, so yeah, it was, uh, and, and fortunately, there are a lot of Cuban journalists that are really, that are excited to participate in a project like this, but they don't have the opportunity. Um, so, um, so it was really exciting for me. I've been a journalist and documentary filmmaker for 20 years. And, um, and this is the first time I've been a part of a project like this, um, that is in the, that's so collaborative. Um, uh, this collaborative in the way that it is, um, it's, it's, really, it's really great. Um, it's, it's very exciting and, and we're, we're, we'll hopefully be doing, uh, we're, we're just today actually we were meeting and, and seeing if we, if we might do a part two of the, of the war in Cuba. Because there's a lot, um, as, as proud as I am of what we've accomplished, I feel like it's just the tip of the iceberg, there's a lot more to do. Even, even though Cubans are, um, and we're all are hoping for better, better times ahead with the new administration, hoping for a better, a, a more a policy of engagement towards Cuba. Um, at the same time, it's not going to happen overnight if there are changes, and um, and sort of the 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 political forces that that really pushed for this hard line uh, policy towards Cuba are very much emboldened and very strong, especially in Florida, right? You know, stronger than they have been in many years. This thing that you made had a, a remarkable success. You know, it's like uh, got over four hundred thousand last I checked <laughs> um, views on the internet. Right, and uh, this is the first time it's been broadcast on television, but uh, uh, it's got 30,000 subscribers. And, uh, you know, the whole idea, I guess, is to get uh, a lot more support and a lot more pressure, you know, on Congress and the administration to uh, normalize the uh, relations with Cuba. But um, the Trump administration just declared Cuba uh, a supporter of terrorism. What's your impression of how that uh, Cubans are reacting to all this? Well, I think Cubans are very uh, hopeful uh, that there will be change because, uh, you know, it's funny, I, we, in, in episode one of the war in Cuba, uh, we, uh, I, uh, we used some images that were filmed in 2016, 15, 16, during the Republican primary, in which uh, we interviewed uh, 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 Cubans, what they thought of the uh, of the Republican primary candidates at that time. There was Trump, there was Rubio, there's Ted Cruz, there's a couple of Cuban Americans. And one there was there was this interview with, with one of the guys who said who was asked about that and said, "Listen, what Obama's done in, in opening up new relations with Cuba is irreversible. Like they weren't so worried. They thought, you know, let Trump win. I, we don't. He can't roll back what's happened. The cat's out of the bag. It's not going to go back to how it was." And, but exactly what he what he thought would not happen happened, and nobody thought that would happen. And especially with Trump, in fact, in those interviews, a lot of the Cubans were uh, were were way more worried about Rubio than Trump. They thought Trump was a business guy. He's very pragmatic. He's not gonna he's not gonna return to these sanctions against Cuba. And he took things to to an extreme that nobody expected. And it wasn't his idea because Trump is not in. I don't think an ideological person. It was uh, very much Rubio behind the scenes pushing that policy. Um, so the thing is, Rubio, Trump's may be gone, but Rubio is not gone. He's still there, and uh, and he's in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. the The head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is Bob Menendez, who's a Democrat and a Cuban American, and and is very much in lockstep with Rubio as far as Cuba policy. And uh, so you have a lot of uh, those uh, those those people are still around. Florida politics hasn't changed. Uh, and so Biden is, uh, there, there's gonna be a, there will definitely be a battle in, in DC and in Florida over the, the fate of uh, Cuba policy. So Cubans I think are optimistic, but cautiously optimistic. So I'm a little bit uh, curious um, about the uh, differences in the Cuban media and the United States media. I'm, I'm kind of a media guy, right? So the reason why 
I actually have been doing this pirate TV project for 24 years is I just got fed up with uh, the the American corporate media and uh, the yeah. propaganda system. And yeah. most people don't even realize, uh, I, I, you know, heard Noam Chomsky say that Americans were the most highly indoctrinated population in the world. And this is like 30 years ago, right? And it took a long time for that to sink in. There's a lot of propaganda about what's going on in the United States. It's mostly what they don't talk about, right? There's not a lot of just flat out lies, but when you cross the border and you start talking about Venezuela, or you start talking about Cuba, or you start talking about uh, Nicaragua, right? It's like right now you're saying that uh, Guaido is the president of, of uh, Venezuela, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the thing is that they just had an election. And, and uh, most Venezuelans don't even know who Guaido is. And so uh, that's a pretty extreme uh, propaganda right there. And in one of these um, you know, parts of the war on um, Cuba, we're talking about like when uh, Trump, you know, reinstated the sanctions that you couldn't get Zoom or you couldn't get um, things on the web that, that we get here in the United States. Uh, how do the Cubans get their information? Well, and I, I could, I, you know, I, I share your perspective on the media, and, and, and I share from a journalist, and, and, and from a journalist, <laughs> Noam Chomsky actually helped inspire me, or definitely shaped a lot of my views when I first started to become a journalist. I feel like uh, manufacturing consent should be required reading for all journalists, but unfortunately, very few have read it. So, you know, your frustration with the media is is uh, really why Belly the Beast was formed in the first place. Because I've worked for all sorts of media organizations, um, uh, newspapers, major television stations, radio, and I, and I've done, you know, we've done video work at a very high level. Exactly. Uh, and in the U.S., it's like you see, you read that, you read an article, and it's there's, it's all true, but but the problem with it is that the headline is not about what's most important. And then the, the most in, the critical information, the article is buried down in the 20th paragraph, way down and nobody actually reads it. And you know the emphasis is all wrong. And then there are certain words that are misleading. And it's like, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's subtle in a way, but it makes all the difference. And it's far more effective because you look, because it does, sir doesn't look like propaganda and you, and you buy into it. And I mean, it's, uh, and it's not, and the and the and the, I think the most uh, powerful part about it is that the journalists themselves don't. Um, they they are, have, um, I think, no. Um, they bought into the paradigm. Yeah, no. The, the journalists are don't are not part of a conspiracy. They're not. They're not being openly censored. They're and and so why? So don't. That's free speech. I'm doing what is important, and this is. I'm telling the truth, and so on. We could have tried to sell the war in Cuba to some media outlet, but we wouldn't have been able to do the war in Cuba. It would have been different. There's no way they wouldn't. Have, I, I wouldn't have been able to find somebody who would have paid us to do that. And if I did, we would have had to have changed it tremendously. It wouldn't have been the same thing you saw. So we decided to do it ourselves and distribute it ourselves. We basically said, all right, we're not only gonna produce it and then try to sell it, which is what you do as a freelance journalist, right? But we were gonna produce it and we're gonna distribute it ourselves. And that's, and that's what, you know, we're just starting. We, we're very proud of the fact that we got to, we've been able to reach several hundred thousand people, but uh, we hope it's just the beginning. We feel like it's a big achievement considering very little, very small budget and we're self-distributing essentially. Um, and bypassing the, the mainstream media because they're just, they're, they're not gonna, they don't, they, they're not interested in the subject. Um, but as far as Cuban media, or the Cuban people and how do they access information? You know, Cubans, because of the embargo, there's a lot of, it's primarily services they're not able to access. Financial services, you know, like uh, um, things like Zoom, um, just the other day, my Google, the Gmail hasn't been working for me recently. And I know that's because of the embargo. There's a lot of sort of services that are, that are difficult to do. As far as information, Cubans are very good about getting information. They're very informed. Even before now, internet's much more available now. People have it on their phones. But even, uh, just two years ago, you couldn't get internet on your phone uh, through, through data. You could get it if you connected via Wi-Fi at a park or a hotel. But even then, Cubans are incredibly informed. Um, uh, but... Uh, uh, 
as far as they're, but they're just as much as you try to inform yourself online, whether in Cuba or the US, it's sometimes hard to because there's not that many, there's not that much good journalism about Cuba anywhere in English or in Spanish. Now, the government, there's a lot of state media and they're, you know, it, uh, they, uh, it, a lot of older people watch it, but younger people don't generally. And then meanwhile, in Miami, there's a huge, uh, very significant uh, media machine that is, that is putting out Miami, the Miami narrative, let's say. And they are very influential and they reach a lot of young Cubans uh, through, uh, you know, everything from WhatsApp to Facebook, through social media and Cuba, a lot of young Cubans are consuming that, that, that news and information. But we feel with Belly of the Beast, we're filling a void. We feel like there's not, there unfortunately isn't a lot of good journalism about these really important issues like the impact of Trump's policies, which were really devastating in Cuba. Hmm. Do you think that uh, young people in Cuba are watching the war on Cuba? <laughs> well, it's hard. That's uh, the Cuban audience is not our primary audience. You know, um, it, it it just isn't. Um, but um, we uh, we I, I'd like to think so. I don't think that many have watched it, unfortunately, because um, it's still very expensive to stream video here uh, through data. Very expensive, and so most Cubans avoid watching. A video like the, the a long video like the 12 minute video on youtube there are a few cubans who can afford to do that unfortunately so uh so we're not there yet um uh, i i think they would appreciate it because i when i've spoken to young cubans who have watched the war in cuba they very much appreciate it and have gotten extremely positive feedback overall but uh but but it's difficult for them to access it we're, we've been we thought of ways to try to get it to to to, to there's something called the paquete here which is basically if you want any movie or, or, or series or any video content, you, someone can, they'll, they'll, they'll copy it over to your hard drive or your memory stick for you for, you know, and it costs a minimal amount. And that's how most Cubans watch shows. In fact, I was just in my team meeting here and one of the members of the team said, oh, did you see the, the recent Netflix series? You know, but of course she's not watching it on Netflix. She's going with her memory stick to someone who's, who's got a pirated version and she's getting it. That's how they get their information. And it's not just series on Netflix, it's also news programs and so on. So uh, we'll see maybe the, the war in Cuba could be distributed in, in, in that way. All right, well, um, let's take a look at that then. Let's watch the war on Cuba and uh, we'll hope to, uh, you know, collaborate some more in the future. Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. It was really uh, a real honor being on your program. Hi, I'm Liz. People come to Havana looking for the real Cuba, and this is what they do. But this is not my Cuba. My Cuba isn't so romantic, but I'm happy here I love my country. Cuba is safe. We've got free healthcare and education. I graduated from university without paying a penny, and I became a journalist. Pero lo mejor que tiene Cuba es su gente. But we've got one huge problem: the economy. La situación está mala. Malísima. Fea, fea. Pésimamente mal. Está difícil. Estresante. Caótica. En Tambela. Ahora mismo está fatal. I mean, me pregunto. <laughs> During the pandemic, people have to wait in line for hours just to buy food. Aquí la cosa está dura. COVID. I'm used to this. I grew up in crisis. Y no es embargo ni bloqueo. Es guerra. The legislation I signed today further tightens that embargo. By maintaining our embargo, el bloqueo económico persiste. Our government blames pretty much everything on the U.S. embargo. They call it the blockade. We get bored of hearing about the blockade all the time. But it's real. The United States has been waging war against Cuba for 60 years. It's not a war with bullets or bombs but it touches every aspect of our lives, recently more than ever. <laughs> K 
¿Cómo está Ernesto? Buenos días. ¿Está listo para trabajar en el campo sí, hoy? ¿cómo no? Voy a trabajar ahora. Hay personas que me conocen de 25 años y no saben que me faltan las piernas. ¿Me puede mostrar sus prótesis? Sí, cómo no. Estas son de aluminio y fibra de plástico. No tienen ni articulación, son rígidas. Y se puede partir por aquí. Y entonces la parte del pie se puede partir también. Una vez por aquí cargando un saco de yuca, se me partió por aquí. Porque a mi hija ya te digo que cuando esto se rompe es un problema. This is where Ernesto goes to get his prosthetics free of charge. But Ernesto can't get the specialized prosthetics he needs because it's illegal for Cuba to buy them. Y existen unas prótesis un poco más resistentes que ustedes le pudieran sí, servir existen, más. Existen unas prótesis más resistentes con más calidad. Caminaría mejor, incluso podía trabajar mucho más, pero no tenemos acceso a ella por el bloqueo. Ernesto doesn't complain. In Cuba, we've lived with scarcity for so many years. We take it for granted. The blockade is the longest trade embargo in modern history. It isn't motivated by concerns about human rights. It's about money and power. Until 1959, Cuba was like a U.S. colony. Our economy was controlled by U.S. companies, corrupt politicians, and the mafia. After the revolution, Cuba nationalized the U.S. companies. We claim our sovereignty, our right to govern ourselves. The government gave basic rights to the majority. Women, black people, campesinos, the working class. The blockade was retaliation. It's basically a form of economic warfare. The blockade stops Cuba from doing business with the United States. They can't buy our stuff and we can't buy theirs. And we can pay for things because banks won't lend us money or even let us open accounts. The blockade also stops Cuba from doing business with other countries. That's not all. The blockade also locks us up of a big part of the internet. We are used to getting bad news from the United States. But five years ago, nos llegaron por primera vez buenas noticias de la Casa Blanca. It does not serve America's interests or the Cuban people to try to push Cuba towards collapse. Que volar. Obama announced new relations with Cuba. He began by loosening the blockade. U.S. airlines and cruise ships started taking tourists to Havana. Business was booming. Clandestina became Cuba's first independent design store in 2015. Idania is Clandestina's co-founder. She started the store after Cuba opened its economy to private business. Clandestinos pretende establecer el trabajo de los jóvenes diseñadores cubanos. After Idania met Obama, Clandestina became a symbol of Cuba's new private sector. Havana was like overcrowded, celebrities, musicians, politicians, everybody. It was insane. Chanel runway, Fast and the Furious shooting. Rolling Stone concert. The mood was anything is possible, all this sense of change, and finally to be aware of, I have a future here. I can stay here, I don't have to leave my country. But uh, then Trump won the election, so. But all of the concessions that Barack Obama has granted the Castro regime were done through executive order which means the next president can reverse them, and that I will do. The Trump administration is imposing new restrictions on U.S. travel to Cuba. John Bolton making a South Florida stop today to talk to the Cuban-American community. Unveiling sweeping changes to Cuba policy. A major blow to the new U.S.-Cuba relationship. The U.S. has banned flights. All families to leave Cuba. The U.S. government will also ban trips by cruise ships. They'll have to go after their finances. Limiting the amount of money. Fresh U.S. sanctions. It's part of a trend. U.S. tourism stopped. 
And if you don't have tourism, you don't have business. No tourism, zero remittances, no trade at all. You are suffocating the private sector. You are suffocating the Cuban people. Since COVID, things have gone from bad to worse. Tiene ibuprofeno por casualidad? No, mami, yo estoy en baja. ¿Y guafarina? Tampoco. ¿Y mefomina? Tampoco. ¿Y nalapril? Yo estoy en baja. You think the U.S. might loosen the embargo during a pandemic? No. Nope. Recently, two Swiss companies refused to sell Cuba ventilators because they were owned by a larger U.S. company. And a U.S.-owned airline wouldn't take a donation of masks and ventilators to Cuba. On top of all that, the Trump administration made it even harder for our family members in the U.S. to send us money. The Trump administration has killed a deal that would allow Cuban baseball players to play for Major League Baseball. El bloqueo afecta hasta nuestro deporte nacional. Sian Vega is one of Cuba's top young baseball prospects. Desde chiquito siempre mi papá me inculcó entrenar, me llevaba todos los días la pelota. Empecé a ver mi talento a partir de los 13, 14 años. Hay ya bastantes peloteros cubanos en la MLB que se han formado aquí en Cuba. Representar a mi país en el más alto nivel, eh, que es la MLB, sería mi sueño, la verdad. Trump, cuando nos cerró las puertas de firmar con la MLB, todo, casi todos los peloteros se sintieron mal por esa noticia. Claro, porque ahora, para, en caso de que tú quisieras jugar con la MLB, tendrías que renunciar. Tendría que renunciar a mi país, no me gustaría, la verdad. Me gustaría jugar y volver a mi país, vivir con mi familia, no estar lejos de ella. For his rivals tonight just might be the last big chance to stop Donald Trump. It's hard to believe now, but five years ago, some Cubans thought a Trump presidency wouldn't be that bad. Si me tuviera que escoger, yo escogería Donald Trump. Y sabe que Cuba tiene un mercado virgen. Y él le interesaría mucho invertir en Cuba. No sé, no creo que todo ese proceso que ha ocurrido lo eche para atrás. That same month, Trump's executives were visiting Cuba and playing golf here. It wasn't the first time Trump tried to do business in Cuba. This is the website for La Oficina Cubana de Propiedad Industrial. It's where foreign companies apply to do business in Cuba. In 2008, Trump registered his brand name for hotels, casinos, beauty contests, television programs, and golf courses. I'm okay with the Cuba situation, but I want to tell you they should be making a good deal. So what or who made Trump change his position on Cuba? Guys, we have a con artist as the front runner in the Republican Party. Thank God he has really large ears, the biggest ears I've ever seen. And you know what they say about men with small hands? Rubio, total lightweight. If he hadn't inherited $200 million, you know where Donald no, no, Trump no, would no, be no. right now? No, no, Selling no. watches in I Manhattan. I want a Trump's fight with Rubio didn't last long. A man that's really become a friend of mine, Senator Marco Rubio. Great guy. After Trump won, they became allies. Trump let Rubio pick his Latin American team, and Rubio wrote Trump's new Cuba policy. I have wonderful memories from our visit during the campaign. I was right before the election. I guess it worked, right? Trump's war in Cuba has won him the support of powerful Cuban American businessmen and politicians like Marco Rubio. They helped him win Florida, the country's biggest swing state, in 2016. And Trump believes this is the way to win again in 2020. I'm Cuban and support Trump. I am so thrilled to be back here with all of my friends in Little Havana. When U.S. presidents say they are talking to the Cuban people, they're not talking to us because we don't get to vote in Florida. Pero los cubanos no cogemos lucha con la política de los Estados Unidos. El bloqueo está ahí, y punto. Así que pa'lante, que no hay más nada. Hi, I'm Liz. Because of COVID, Havana is on lockdown right now. 
there is no public transportation. If you wanna get somewhere, toca caminar. O montar bicicleta. But we are used to this. Back in the 90s, we stopped getting oil from the Soviet Union after it collapsed. There were massive fuel shortages and we had to move around without cars or buses. Last year, we got hit by another energy crisis. But this time, it was different. Vista Hermosa is an organic farm on the outskirts of Havana. No chemicals are used on its animals or crops. And recently, they've even stopped running their tractors, but not by choice. ¿Ustedes reciben combustible del Estado? Eh, hoy por hoy, digamos que un 5 o 10% del que recibíamos hace algunos años. Nosotros teníamos dos tractores acá en la finca y están siendo sustituidos por la tradición animal. La tierra que usted pudiera lograr aral en una hora con un tractor necesitaría un día con un de buey. Debido a las escaseces, nos vimos prácticamente obligados a convertir la finca en una finca ecológica. Pero en las grandes siembras, el petróleo es el eje de todo. Esto va a traer consecuencias graves para la producción de alimentos para el pueblo. ¡Ese palacio! Havana's market still has fruit and vegetables, but a lot of basic foods have become hard to find. Están entrando menos camiones. Están entrando menos mercancía también. Y la calidad no es la misma, porque mucha mercancía se está echando a perder en los campos, no hay combustible para los camiones. No están permitiendo la entrada de los buques petroleros por el bloqueo que tienen hecho a Cuba. The U.S. embargo, or blockade, has been around for 60 years, but it got worse last year when the Trump administration began blocking oil from getting to Cuba. Out of Havana, where there appears to be some kind of gas crisis. El combustible escasea en Cuba una vez más. You can see the long lines. En estos días no nos va a entrar combustible. The Trump administration is sanctioning the ships who deliver that fuel. La isla dejó de recibir el petróleo subsidiado de Venezuela. The U.S. wants to stop the oil trade between the two political allies. But... Cuba used to depend on the Soviet Union for oil. Now, we depend on Venezuela. 20 years ago, Hugo Chavez was elected president of Venezuela. Cuba and Venezuela became close allies. Venezuela has more oil than any other country in the world. But their healthcare system needed help. So the two governments made a deal. Venezuela sent us oil, and we sent them my mom. I'll never forget the day my mom flew to Venezuela on a medical mission. It was my 10th birthday and I was so sad. I couldn't understand why she left. I do now. Cuban doctors who go on missions can earn more than 10 times their normal salaries. When my mom came back, she remodeled our house and bought a new refrigerator and television. Incluso pagó por mi fiesta y mis fotos de quinces. That's a big deal in Cuba, and it's not cheap. ¿Por qué te fuiste a Venezuela, mami? Me hice médico, cuyo objetivo fundamental precisamente era brindar ayuda a las personas que lo necesitan. Y era muy difícil decir que no. Y también, también, porque no te lo voy a, no te lo voy a negar, motivada también por el aspecto económico. Era la primera vez que nos separábamos y realmente fue muy difícil para tu madre. Prácticamente con el alma rota, dejando una niña de apenas 10 años. De lo cual me iba a perder muchas cosas de su crecimiento, pero no solamente fui yo, fuimos tantas las que tuvimos el paso al frente y realmente no, no, me, no me arrepiento. ¿Te parecía justa la cooperación que tenía Cuba y Venezuela, es decir, el convenio entre los dos países? Yo pienso que sí, que, que fue justo. Nosotros le brindábamos salud y ellos estaban muy necesitados de eso. Y también era justo para nosotros porque recibíamos petróleo, también muy necesitado por nuestro país. This troika of tyranny, this triangle of terror stretching from Havana to Caracas to Managua. Under President Trump, the United States is taking direct action against all three regimes. In 2017, Trump named John Bolton as his national security advisor. Bolton is a neoconservative known for pushing for U.S. military intervention around the world.
So you've, you've called for regime change in Iraq, Libya, Iran, and Syria. The decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein was the correct decision. The secure route to preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons is to change the regime in Tehran. The way to end the North Korean uh, nuclear threat is to end North Korea. Under Trump, Volta began working to overthrow the Venezuelan government. Until recently, Venezuela exported more oil to the United States than anywhere else. Why topple a government you are dealing with? In 2005, Hugo Chavez began providing cheap oil to countries throughout the Caribbean. Venezuela's oil diplomacy offered a way for countries to be less dependent on the United States, and it helped Cuba reduce the impact of the blockade. But this South-South cooperation threatened U.S. hegemony. John Bolto began talking about the Monroe Doctrine, which dates back to 1823. The Monroe Doctrine is alive and well. The Monroe Doctrine basically says the Western Hemisphere belongs to the United States. It's been used to justify U.S. invasions in Latin America for more than a century. Send the troops! We seek a peaceful transition of power, but all options are open. Nothing could be better for the future of Venezuela, and nothing could be better for the future of another captive nation, Cuba. Thank you, Mr. President. But the U.S.-led regime change in Venezuela failed. So, the Trump administration began accusing Cuba of having sent troops to prop up the government of Nicolás Maduro. The dictator Maduro is a Cuban puppet. The people of Venezuela are essentially Cuba's hostage. Cuba is the true imperialist power in Venezuela. If this afternoon 20 to 25,000 Cubans left Venezuela, I think Maduro would fall by midnight. There are 20,000 Cubans in Venezuela, and most of them are health workers like my mom. The idea that a poor country like Cuba is propping up an oil-rich country like Venezuela is crazy. Pero la verdad, poco importa. Trump used this as an excuse to block oil shipments from Venezuela to Cuba. Queremos agradecer la conciencia profunda del pueblo venezolano pese a las criminales persecuciones lo único que falta y no lo van a hacer porque estamos muy cerquita es tirar una bomba atómica Luis Berriz found a way to lessen the impact of the US oil blockade todo esto es energía solar el aire acondicionado, el ventilador, las luces, las computadoras, el televisor Luis promotes renewable energy through Cuba Solar. It's an organization he founded during the oil shortages of the 90s. Estos son paneles fotovoltaicos también hechos en Cuba. Produce lo suficiente para una casa por medio en Cuba. El problema no es disminuir los consumos de electricidad. Yo diría que es al revés aumentarlo con las fuentes renovables en ella, no con petróleo extranjero. Tenemos que aprender a usar lo que tenemos. Y lo que tenemos es esto, lo que tenemos es nuestro sol. ¿Quién, quién, ¿Cómo me va a bloquear el sol? Luis's use of solar energy is inspiring, pero es la excepción, no la regla. ¿Sus vecinos también aprovechan la energía renovable así? Desgraciadamente no tanto. Esos paneles son del gobierno. A mí no me costó nada. ¿Cómo lo puede conseguir otra persona? Primero, no puedes. ¿Dónde yo compro un panel? Si en la tienda no hay nada, no se vende. ¿Y, quién, y por qué no se vende? Pues precisamente por el bloqueo. Tenemos el conocimiento para poder hacerlo. No están los recursos. Ahí donde están, donde están los problemas. Resources in Cuba are scarcer than ever. And not just because of the oil blockade. The private sector was already in bad shape after Trump stopped U.S. tourists coming to Cuba. Sergio became one of Cuba's first bike taxi drivers 25 years ago during the energy crisis caused by the fall of the Soviet Union. As bad as things were then, Sergio says there are worse now. Casi siempre había clientes. 
ahora no. Y puedes salir a los lugares, te puedes parar aquí, te puedes parar allá, te... es por gusto. Sergio no depende de gasolina o turismo, pero sus clientes do. Contra un todo, haga un vuelco. El ciudadano cubano está perdiendo su poder adquisitivo. ¿Y quiénes son sus clientes? Son trabajadores también por cuenta propia, carpinteros, albañiles, no hay economía. Como para contratar a ese albañil, a ese carpintero, ¿no? es decir, si no hay economía para pagar a ellos, yo estoy prácticamente sin trabajo. Si bien la crisis de combustible genera que ustedes eh, tengan una mayor demanda. Sí, una mayor demanda, pero había una crisis general de casi todo. No era solamente la falta de combustible, era, era un bloqueo total. Sobre, sobre todo, ojalá y esto termine. In Cuba, we are used to getting by, one way or another. We call it resolver. We take junk and make it useful. And we use what we have to survive and improve our lives. We are tough, resilient, and we need to be. The oil blockade was just one part of the economic war against Cuba. There would be more to come. I'm Liz. The United States has 60 times more COVID deaths per capita than we do here in Cuba. No me sorprende. Cuba has more doctors per person than any other country. We treat our doctors like war heroes, especially these days. Estoy segura de que en Cuba vamos a estar bien. 100% confianza y seguridad de la medicina cubana. Y nosotros confiamos en ellos porque son los mejores médicos del mundo. Since COVID began, every night at 9 p.m. we cheer for our doctors. Pero fuera de Cuba, todos no son aplausos. In the last few years, our doctors have come under attack. Every morning, tens of thousands of doctors, nurses, and medical students take to the streets across Cuba. They are on the front lines of our fight against COVID. Talia Ruiz is a first-year medical student. No me siento con miedo. Nosotros si nos cuidamos y tomamos las medidas necesarias, tampoco tenemos por qué contagiarnos. Hay médicos que han ido y se han enfrentado directamente con la enfermedad y no se han contagiado, como por ejemplo mi papá. Hola papá. Talia's father, Juan Jesús, is a family doctor who works at a small clinic next to their home. In March, he joined a group of Cuban doctors on a medical mission to Lombardy, Italy. At the time, Lombardy was the global epicenter of the pandemic. Por el número de casos desbordó los sistemas de salud. Ayudamos sobre todo a este personal médico que ya no podía ya con ese volumen de casos y salvamos unas cuantas vidas. Ah, sí. Caminar hacia el acto de despedida, en todas las casas la gente salía y nos aplaudía. Esa fue la sensación más agradable que he sentido en mi vida. Esa, por esas cosas que uno sale de misión. It wasn't the first time Juan Jesús risked his life far from home. He's part of the Henry Reeve Brigade, Cuba's medical special forces. Henry Reeve era un expedicionario norteamericano que vino a pelear en la guerra de 68 para Cuba contra los españoles. Se inauguró la brigada en el año 2005. Un huracán que se llamó Katrina, que acabó con Nuevo León, hubo una cantidad de muertos tremenda. Cuba se ofrece en mandar 100 médicos para trabajar conjuntamente con los médicos norteamericanos y ya estábamos listos. George W. Bush rejected Cuba's offer to help New Orleans. Since then, 
Juan Jesus has treated survivors of natural disasters and epidemics around the world. In 2014, he fought Ebola in Liberia, West Africa. Nos decía en la calle, ¿no? Ustedes están locos, los van, se van a morir todos allá. La epidemia de Ebola es una enfermedad muy letal y vamos asustados. ¿Por qué someterse a ese tipo de, de condiciones? Por el afán de, de sentirse útil, sentir que salvaste una vida. Cada vez que pienso en que es probable que no me hayan pagado mucho, yo nada más que me acuerdo de las, de las caras de, los, de las personas que, que se salvaron, ¿entiendes? Nosotros teníamos un niñito que se le murió a la familia entera y nosotros eran su único sustén. Usted sabe la alegría de verlo a él todos los días vivo. Eso es como si te pagaran mucho, mucho, mucho dinero. Cuba's International Medical Program began in 1960 when it sent a health brigade to Chile in response to a deadly earthquake. Since then, Cuba has sent more than 400,000 medical personnel to 164 countries. For decades, Cuba's medical missions were purely humanitarian. The government didn't charge a penny. Today, Cuba still sends thousands of doctors to poor countries in Africa and Latin America at no cost. But in the last 20 years, Cuba has also begun charging wealthier countries. Under some of these deals, Cuban doctors receive about 25% of what the host governments pay. About 75% goes to the state. The money pays for free health care in Cuba. 30,000 Cuban healthcare workers now serve on missions in 59 countries. For years, U.S. officials and Florida politicians have vilified Cuba's medical missions. Since Donald Trump was elected, they've intensified their attacks. Okay, so the allegation is that Cuban doctors are being sent around the world to work in different places. These Cuban m medical missions, if you'll call them, are really just disguised human trafficking. We've noticed how the regime in Havana has taken advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic to continue its exploitation of Cuban medical workers. This business of forced labor is the functional equivalent of modern-day sla uh, slavery. USAID offered $3 million dollars in grants to investigate alleged rights violations of Cuban medical personnel. But the campaign against Cuba's international medical program had little impact until November 2018. And the breaking news is the far-right candidate, Jair Bolsonaro, has won Brazil's presidential race. Dubbed the Donald Trump of the tropics. With a history of making racist, misogynistic and homophobic comments. He also talks up dictatorship. President Trump tweeted about it this morning. We agreed that Brazil and the United States will work closely together on trade and military and everything else. Bolsonaro wasted no time in forcing an end to Cuba's medical program in Brazil. I jamais faria um acordo com Cuba nesses termos. Isso é trabalho escravo. É difícil. After Bolsonaro's comments, Cuba sent its doctors in Brazil home. It was a big blow to Cuba's health system, which lost hundreds of millions of dollars in annual income. Cuba's doctors were also affected. In Cuba, you don't have to go far to see a doctor, porque en cada comunidad vive y trabaja uno. Mario Diaz is a family doctor. Two years ago, he was in Rio de Janeiro when Bolsonaro won the election. Me gustaba que era ciudad. Nos recibieron muy bien por la diferencia del trato que da el médico brasileño al médico cubano. Los tratamos como personas, como un igual. No es una mercancía. No es que yo lo atiendo para coger dinero. No solo caemos en zonas que médicos brasileños no quieren ir a trabajar. Zonas de pobreza y lugares incluso que nunca tuvieron un médico. ¿Cuánto gana un médico trabajando en Cuba? Tú tienes un salario básico, que es de 1.740 pesos. Allá ganaba 700 dólares. Es verdad que el gobierno de nosotros, con el sistema de salud, se quedaba con una parte de ese contrato. Pagaba por cada médico cubano 12.000 reales. Nosotros recibíamos alrededor de 3.000 pero lo invierte aquí en obra social. De la reparación de las instituciones de salud, de la compra de materia prima para producir medicamentos en nuestro país. No es que se lo coge el presidente. Tú lo miras desde el punto de vista personal, a lo mejor lo ves como injusto. 
pero tú piensas en algo más grande y ves que tiene un beneficio para el país. Hay un dicho aquí en Cuba que nosotros usamos que es que el ladrón piensa que todo el mundo es de su misma condición. Ellos piensan que todo el mundo gira alrededor del dinero nada más. Y no, no es así. Yo quise ser médico siempre. ¿Para qué? Para ayudar a la gente. Eso no es porque voy a ser rico. De hecho, yo vivo aquí mismo donde trabajo. Yo me encuentro con mis vecinos en la cola de la tienda. ¿Dónde entra Estados Unidos en todo esto? Bolsonaro siempre siguió la línea del presidente americano. A él le dicen el Trump latino. Estados Unidos quiere cortar esa entrada para ahogar la economía cubana, para tratar de lograr un cambio político en la, aquí en la isla. ¿entiendes? Cuando Cuba se retiró del programa, alrededor de 1.700 municipios quedaron de un golpe sin médico. Así. Yo tuve la experiencia de un paciente mío allá en Brasil, un señor de alrededor de 70 años, analfabeto. Y él fue, marcó con su tapa para ir a despedirse de mí. Lloró aquí en el hombro mío. Millions of Brazilians in poor communities were left without health care. It was just the beginning. Ecuador's president became a Trump ally. And then, in November 2019, he expelled hundreds of Cuban doctors. That same month, a U.S.-supported coup ousted Bolivian President Evo Morales. Bolivia's de facto government immediately took aim at the Cuban doctors. Los falsos médicos cubanos. Nos acusaba de que no éramos médicos, nos acusaba de bandido. Joandra Muro was head of the Cuban medical mission in Bolivia. Amenazaban con quemar la casa de los médicos cubanos, a otros los llevaban a la Interpol, a dos de nuestros compañeros los apuntaron con armas, revisaron a, a nuestras mujeres, algunas las desnudaron. Cuando sucedió lo de Brasil, el argumento era de que los médicos cubanos eran víctimas, hay los pobres médicos cubanos que son esclavos del gobierno eh, de Cuba. Sin embargo, el discurso respecto a Bolivia cambió. Ya no eran víctimas, sino que eran victimarios. Siempre van a buscar algún argumento para llegar al mismo fin, que es desacreditar. En Bolivia no podían hablar del dinero que Cuba recibía. En Bolivia cada colaborador recibía un equipiente de 800 dólares, pero era un pago directo al colaborador. A Cuba no le pagaba. ¿Qué usted cree que está detrás de todo esto? Ya había una comunicación del propio gobierno de los Estados Unidos de una agresión abierta y además financiada para atacar la colaboración médica cubana. El carro que estaba allí frente a nuestras casas era un carro de la embajada americana. ¿De ¿Qué hace un carro de la embajada de los Estados Unidos en el momento que nos están deteniendo nosotros como médicos cubanos. After Joandra returned to Havana, she became the head of Elam, the biggest medical school in the world. La Escuela Latinoamericana de Medicina es una escuela totalmente gratuita. Hemos graduado más de 30.000 jóvenes de 117 países y ya tenemos 198 graduados de los Estados Unidos. El mundo necesita médicos. Que no fuera solo mandando ayuda, mandando colaboración médica. Que qué importante sería que esos países tuvieran su propia formación de médicos. Esto es nuestro aporte en un mundo tan desigual y en un mundo que hoy quizás no te brinda la posibilidad desde el propio lugar donde vives de formarte como médico. In the face of the global pandemic, Cuba's international medical program has grown. The Henry Reeve Brigade has sent nearly 4,000 doctors and nurses to more than 30 countries to fight COVID. But the Cubans were still not welcome in Bolivia, Ecuador, and Brazil. In Bolivia, the healthcare system there has been overwhelmed by the coronavirus pandemic. Hospitals are at breaking point. People aren't just dying in their cars, they're also dying on the street. Ecuador is seeing one of the world's worst coronavirus outbreaks. Corpses wrapped in plastic and left on the sidewalk in Ecuador. Brazil's infections are rocketing, particularly among the poor. They're digging thousands upon thousands of graves. Brazil now has the second highest number of cases and deaths in the world. Even with so many doctors fighting COVID in other countries, Cuba has contained the pandemic at home. Yo atiendo en esta zona 952 pacientes y no he tenido caso de COVID. El punto fundamental de que el COVID no haya sido una epidemia inmensa en Cuba ha sido la pesquisa y el aislamiento de contacto. Mi hija pesquisando. La pobrecita, subir y bajar escaleras no es nada de nada, pero es lo que le toca. 
¿Qué edad tú tenías cuando tu papá se fue a la primera misión? Cuando yo tenía un año ya estaba cumpliendo una misión. Es tu papá y, y quieres tenerlo aquí y sabes como que sientes que te falta algo. Con el pasar de los años vas entendiendo la situación, que ese es su propósito en esta vida. No es un médico simplemente cubano, es un médico de, del mundo. Mi sueño es ser un médico tan anegado y sacrificado como lo es mi papá. Hay muchas campañas difamatorias, sobre todo de parte de los Estados Unidos, pero al final todo es mentira. Son gente con un corazón inmenso que aman lo que están haciendo. ¿Usted ha notado un cambio entre las actitudes del gobierno de los Estados Unidos con los médicos cubanos en los últimos años? Hay una mayor hostilidad respecto a las misiones médicas cubanas. ¿Por qué están haciendo eso? Es fácil. Es parte del bloqueo. La Henry Ríos es muy altruista. Hace las misiones para servir a los demás. Pero hay misiones que si eran remuneradas, que Cuba recibía dinero de esas misiones. Ese es la, el objetivo fundamental del decreto de los médicos cubanos. No porque le interese la cantidad de horas que trabajé, sencillamente para privar al país de otra fuente más de dinero. ¿Acaso el gobierno de los Estados Unidos no tiene suficientes problemas que resolver para andar preocupándose por nosotros? Some people say the blockade isn't a big deal, that our economic problems are only caused by our government or by socialism. If that's true, ¿por qué no quitan el bloqueo? 